Thank you very much, David. I, uh, it, it's a little strange uh, in, in our little bubbles during this COVID event, <clears throat> but uh, to everyone out there who, who uh, I'm usually used to having sitting in chairs in front of me, uh, I'd like to send you all a virtual but a very heartfelt salt spring hug. I hope you all got it. My, uh, <clears throat> my talk tonight is, as David mentioned, and if we think of just for a second that the, the world is, is rotating about the, the sun and we go through four seasons each year on salt spring, maybe five seasons, and virtually without us being aware of it, but as the light changes and other subtleties such as heat, um, the birds go about their business through the seasons, almost inconspicuously, uh, day by day and month by month. We're in March the 8th today, light winter, or pre-spring on salt spring. And a lot of birds that winter around this part of the coast are still here. Um, I'm going to deal with a couple of the land-based birds first. The golden crown sparrow um, arrives in late September and stays through till the spring before heading back to the mountains. And I'm going to give you two examples. Uh, by the way, when, I'm, when I give live talks, I have my sturdy amplifier with a CD player inside it, and I'm still not technically that great, so I have the amplifier here on the desk to play to you. Uh, but the, the Golden Crown Sparrow, there are two examples, and th this is a good introduction to uh, sparrows and warblers uh, have regional dialects. And this first one, the Golden Crown, you'll hear four examples that I recorded up in, uh, on, in the Tonquin Valley in, in, in Jasper uh, National Park a few years ago. And then you'll hear one example of a Golden Crown Sparrow arriving on Salt Spring in the early fall. And that probably, but I don't know for certain, nested in the mountains either of Vancouver Island or the coastal mountains, and you'll, you'll hear the difference. And uh, in this first recording on the, in the uh, Rockies, listen to the first note. I'm sure a lot of saxophone players would love to be able to bend a note like this. Now we're coming to the salt spring example. Quite a difference, regional dialect. You might, you could call that, and uh, but it's easy to recognize it's the same species. The next one <clears throat> is a thrush, the varied thrush, and they are uh, they spend the winter here and uh, they spend most of their time on the ground hunting for uh, uh, various insects under the bushes and under leaves. And they have single note uh, calls rather like a referee's whistle, but each time the pitch changes a little bit or the tone. So here's a varied thrush and we were down in uh, Ruckle Park a couple of days ago and several of them were really starting to vocalize quite loudly before heading north again. Varied thrush. American widgeon. So those were the two land 
based birds. We'll move on to the water based birds now. And there are many more of them in this part of the coast that arrive. They start in late September and their, their peak arrivals uh, occurs in November. And uh, you'll find mugulls, loons, uh, surf scoters, bufflehead, common and barrows golden eye, long eared, uh, sorry, long tailed duck, mallard, horn grebe, and, and many others. I'm going to play you a couple of examples. Uh, the first one being the American widgeon. And uh, this one, uh, I always think the male sounds rather like uh, a rubber ducky, a squeaky kind of sound. The harsh sound is the female that sounds more like a duck. That's the female again. Female in flight going overhead. Common Maganza. Now, this is quite <clears throat> an interesting uh, large diving duck. Uh, and if, if you get close to it, you'll see that the edge of its beak is serrated for helping to filter uh, sand and gravel to find the food. Uh, they come into Salt Spring, and I'm thinking particularly of Burgoyne Bay, but you, you also see them in uh, Fulford Harbor and other parts of the shoreline. The First Nations uh, have for a long time called Burgoyne Bay Quackwam because the that's the, the name for a female Maganza and they've been uh, arriving in that bay for probably for thousands of years and had a name long before we gave them a name. And Heather and I do a, a coastal water bird watch uh, every month through the winter at Burgoyne Bay. And um, we find that most of the species start arriving in November and peak in January. But their numbers vary a lot because they don't always come to the same place. But uh, to give you some idea, the last three years, uh, the Magansas in 2019, uh, we counted 42 in January. Last year, a tremendous year, there were 190, and that was terrific in, in Burgoyne Bay. And then this year, there were four. So they vary a lot uh, over the years. Uh, we didn't consider it was a, a serious problem this year, only having four. Uh, we'll wait for a few more years and see how the numbers do. In the summertime, they, uh, they had... Uh, or in the spring, they head north to the boreal forest where they nest uh, in trees, in ca tree cavities, and spend a lot of time on the water to feed and to uh, bring up their young. That is a female in flight, a quack one. She's coming into land on the water. There she goes into the water. Now she's met up with a, a male. And uh, actually that part of the recording I did in Saskatchewan, this next part is in actually in Manitoba. And it was a quiet, a very quiet dirt road that led north from Thompson to a little place called um, Gwillam on the Nelson River. Very, very quiet, beautiful for recording, no abstraneous noises. Uh, but that particular road and that area 
became somewhat infamous uh, two summers ago when there were some uh, horrible murders in Northern BC and the RCMP tracked the two culprits through to that little road where finally on the Nelson River, they uh, committed suicide. But uh, we, really, we really liked it for its remoteness and its quietness uh, for recording. But here's the rather throaty sound now of the male when a female arrives. <laughs> American Robert. Now this is a very, I'm going to move on to resident birds. Although the robin isn't a great example because they move around quite a lot, but there are always some here on Salt Spring. And the uh, arriving birds in November, probably from the mountains and further north, uh, they arrive in big flocks. And uh, we've counted up to 90 on the trail on Burgoyne Bay, going to the place where we do our water bird survey. And they've started to sing already this year on uh, March the 8th, uh, the lovely Cheer Up, Cheer Lee song, and a few contact calls at the end. But they're, uh, because they're so common, we sometimes overlook them. But lovely song, and they've started to sing already this year. There's the contact calls. This particular bit you hear not only at dawn, but also at dusk when most of the other birds have gone quiet. This is the last bird that seems to be saying good night to everybody. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that sound. California quail. Uh, here's another interesting local species. They were actually introduced uh, in the last century or more ago. But uh, let me play you a song first because they're, they're uh, that's the clucking sound. Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. There were 175 of them counted on the Christmas bird count in December. So there's quite a few on Salt Spring. And we certainly have them parading through our yard to visit the feeder every day. They, uh, the, there's an interesting story behind them. A guy called Dr. Uh, William Tolmy uh, arrived in the, the mid-1800s uh, to, to take a job with the Hudson Bay Company. And he started uh, at uh, Vancouver on the uh, Columbia River and then moved north as, uh, as the company moved its headquarters to Victoria. And he eventually ended up as a chief factor before he retired. And he also... Uh, had a job as, uh, got voted in as an MLA when BC joined Confederation. But I'm more interested in that he started uh, an estate at uh, Cloverdale, which is now a suburb of Victoria. And at, uh, at its peak, there were about uh, 1,100 acres. And uh, he decided to go down to San Francisco to buy some cattle. And uh, that was in 1866. And while he was there, he saw and obtained some California quail. He brought them up to his estate 
bred them until they were over 200. Then he started to let them go. And uh, we've got lots on the Gulf Islands and uh, Southern Vancouver Island. And, and there are some in the southern part of, uh, of the Okanagan Valley. And this hummingbird, another bird that uh, joined us from California. The uh, hummingbirds, as you probably know, have evolved symbiotically with flowering plants. And they go back 28 to 34 million years ago when the, this relationship began as flowers were created and the hummingbirds helping to uh, gaining energy from the, from the flowers as well as pollinating the plants. The Annas uh, is now a year round resident and many of you out there, I'm sure have got uh, uh, regular uh, birds out there visiting your hummingbird feeders. Uh, if you're not sure, an easy way uh, of, of uh, feeding them with your feeders is to think of the digits on your hand, four parts water, to one part your thumb, uh, white sugar. They like sucrose best. And that provides them with this, with energy. And remember to keep them clean. Um, don't leave them for too long. Uh, mix a good batch, put it in your fridge, and then change uh, the contents of the feeder regularly every few days uh, so that uh, any mites or other tiny critters that get in there can't turn the sugar uh, into fungus. Uh, they start nesting in, uh, mating and nesting in December, and they're certainly nesting now, as some of you will know, tiny little nests, and um, they'll have several broods between now and uh, from December through to the spring, and um, give us all lots of pleasure because they, they've really formed a somewhat symbiotic relationship with us as well as the plants uh, and the feeders we put out. And uh, whenever the feed is empty or it's taken in to, uh, uh, to be filled and I'm out in the yard, they'll buzz me and let me know uh, where's the food. Uh, so neat little critters, lovely little birds. They're a delight to have around. So here's the Northern flicker. So here's here's a, a woodpecker, uh, quite common, brownish bird, red under the wings on the coast, uh, east of the Rockies. They're yellow under the wings. <clears throat> they have four distinctive sounds, um, and we will start with the call with with the song. drumming and uh stop the recorder a second because the drumming is used for a similar purpose as the song uh to protect the territory and to attract mates so uh the drumming has a very similar function with woodpeckers Very 
calls. That is a contact call, usually heard in the winter, but can be heard after the nesting season in the fall. It sounds like clear, and uh, you, you, you'll hear that a lot, although at uh, the last few days, I've started to hear the, uh, the flickers starting to sing. Woika, woika, woika. That's a kind of familiar sound that the pair make around the nest site, communicating with each other. Pileated woodpecker. Here's the largest woodpecker in North America and quite common on Salt Spring. It, it has a, a pileated, it refers to its crest and uh, some people refer to it as a paprika mohawk, uh, referring to it like a like a head do. But it's it's a big bird. Uh, this is one of the pairs, and there are several that, that I'm referring to tonight uh, that stick together all the year round. But with the pileated, they cover such large distances uh, that we're not usually aware of both of them at the same time. But people who study them uh, closely say that uh, during the day, they'll cross paths at least once. And uh, if they're on a log or a branch, they'll actually tap bills before they move on. That's the song. Heavy drum roll. That's tapping. And all the woodpeckers do that to communicate between the two woodpeckers. Uh, I'm not using the uh, red-headed woodpecker here. That's an Eastern species. But uh, I've got a recording where the, the male has produced a new uh, 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 cavity for the female to inspect for a nest site. And uh, she goes in and inspects it. And then she starts to tap out a message. And uh, broadly speaking, the message must have said, uh, no, this isn't suitable, because they both flew away afterwards. So the tapping has some definite, uh, it's a bit like Morse code, probably simpler, but I don't know that, uh, that the two woodpeckers will use that tapping. That's the woika woika sound that the affiliated to me. Chestnut back chickadee. Now here's a cute little critter. We all like the chickadees. Um, they flock together in the winter, winter flocks, and uh, they will use uh, woodpecker cavities to sleep at night. Uh, it's not so cold here, but uh, chickadees, uh, particularly in the colder parts of the country, uh, huddle together in woodpecker cavities at night, which helps to keep them warm. Plus, they have the ability to drop their internal body temperature by about six degrees uh, overnight to save energy. Um, it's probably what we should all do in our houses. But um, David's the energy expert. We'll let him talk about that. Anyway, here's our local chestnut back chickadee. And they're only found uh, on Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands. The mainland chickadees do not cross the, the, the Georgia Strait for some reason. <laughs>
Stellas J. Uh, this is uh, quite a raucous bird, a big member of the, of the COVID family. And uh, it has two typical calls, but it also can mimic. And I'll let you guess what it's mimicking at the end. Harsh notes. Second, second song will call. Chuck, 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 chuck. I think the mimic is coming. Yeah, that's an imitation of uh, a red-tailed hawk. And uh, all of the Js, the Blue J, the Canada J, and the Stellar's J, all seem to be able to mimic that particular bird. And it seems to be for some kind of intimidation. Uh, I don't know whether that's really true, but uh, we were having a picnic once uh, and the J came very close, but wouldn't come to the picnic table and uh, started to do those imitations and did about 14 or 15 of them, one after the other. And we eventually uh, tossed it some food and uh, that made it quite happy. The dawn chorus is mainly associated with springtime. So this next one is uh, another member of the COVID family. Uh, the American crow and the version on the west coast here is somewhat smaller than the crows across the American crows across the rest of the con continent. We used to call, until quite recently call them the northwestern crow, but they're now American crows. And in the winter, they're starting to uh, look for nest sites again now, by the way, but uh, in the winter they form together into larger groups. And uh, I've counted as many as so oh, 70 together on Salt Spring, but in the lower mainland, where there are many, many more crows, they get together in Burnaby in huge flocks. Um, there's an area around Still, Still uh, Creek. Stillwater Creek. Stillwater Creek, thank you. That. Um, is quite well lit by surrounding uh, high-rise apartments and a Mc McDonald's. And this is some of the recording I made in that area. However, there are always a few birds vocalizing even in the winter. One remarkable phenomenon is the huge roost of northwestern crows here in the lower mainland. These crows gather around Spillwell Creek, better known as McDonald's. Let's have a listen to these intelligent members of the COVID family. We don't know precisely why they roost in such large numbers, but we do know that they have a complex society. The area is very well lit by McDonald's and other high-rise buildings. This provides protection from owls and other predators. The birds spread out all across the lower mainland each morning. Their loud vocal sounds may be communicating good feeding areas. Of 
spotted tohi. The uh, tohis, I haven't heard one trilling yet, but their song uh, are fast and slow trills, uh, and they communicate with kind of whiny notes, which I'll play in a second. And these are uh, another species that stick together in pair groups uh, all the year round. And you're usually aware of both towhees uh, communicating with each other in your, in your yard. That's the trill. Fast, the trill. Toei. Toei. I think you'll all recognize that. That's a harsher alarm note. Eastern song sparrow. The uh, song sparrow is another uh, uh, regular uh, songster around Salt Spring and elsewhere. These birds uh, also stick together in pairs, and the female sings as well as the male. And they like to be close to water, uh, along the seashore, uh, creeks, uh, and lakes. And uh, the pair at the bottom of our yard uh, started singing about a week ago. And they, they through the rest of the winter, except on a sunny day when they might sing a few songs, uh, they have a call note uh, that sounds very much like uh, a house sparrow, uh, cheap, or cheap, 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 slow and fast, they do them. Uh, but here's the song sparrow. It's uh, mnemonic for the song is maids, maids, put on the kettle, little, little. And that has tiny variations. If you listen carefully, each bird has eight to 11 slight variations on its song. And across the continent, uh, the, the variations are different. And Cornell Laboratory of Natural Sound has more than 200 examples uh, in the computers. So here's the song sparrow. And if you listen very carefully, you can hear the subtle changes. Red-breasted nuthatch. The little tin trumpet bird in the woods. And uh, you can hear this uh, in the winter and in the spring and summer. Pacific Wren. This, uh, this little bird has a, comp a very complex song. Uh, the male and the female sing. And these, this is another couple that sticks together. They're monogamous and they have a lovely complex song, which uh, makes you think about the syrinx, the uh, sound box at the bottom of their windpipe or trachea, uh, which has two halves. 
and each half can be operated separately or uh, working together produce these kind of complex songs and it also uh, has an interesting contact call like chip or chip 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 and this one i recorded in the driveway of one of our famous artists i used it because there's a, a gentle creek flowing in the background Thanks for that sound. Buick's Wren. This uh, second Wren uh, has a nice musical song. It starts usually with uh, an upslurred note and then three or four more musical notes. And it also has some scolding chatter, which you'll hear at the end. But in most of these songs, listen for the upslurred note at the beginning, which uh, because their song is somewhat variable, uh, sometimes uh, it fools me until I hear the full song uh, with the upslurred note. There's a good upswing note. Scolding chatter. Making all of those sounds at the moment. This time of year. European Starling. <clears throat> You'll know that these uh, critters were introduced in the 1890s by a man living in New York who wanted to, to have all of Shakes the birds that Shakespeare mentioned in Central Park. And uh, most of them died out, but the starling took and quickly expanded its range all around North America. It has a, a lot of chattering sounds. It's a good mimic and a diagnostic uh, note. If you're not sure, listen for the wolf whistles. And I'll point those out and I've put one of its imitations in and I'll let you uh, decide what that is when it comes up at the end. There's the chapel. There's a wolf whistle. There's an alarm as I walk close to the nest site. And they're flying away. There's the invitation. A bald eagle. I'm sure you all got that one. Red winged blackbird. Here's an interesting one that uh, sticks around in Salt Spring year round, whereas in most of North America, they migrate south in the winter. But here on the West Coast, it's mild enough for them to uh, to find insects to feed on uh, all through the winter. And we've got several winter roosts, uh, at least five on the island that I know of. And uh, two of them are easy to, to uh, locate, uh, one at the Fernwood Dock and one at the beginning of the little trail down to Bettis Bay. And they, they, they stay together all the winter and make quite a racket. Concrete.
as the whistle note. Here's the chatter, the clink or tink. That's a flourish, and it's usually made, but not always, by the female. The, the males have little small uh, territories in the cattails, and if a female leaves his territory for various reasons, she often makes that flourishing sound uh, when she leaves or returns. There it goes. Pine siskin. Now, I'm sure you're all aware that we've had some big flocks of pine siskin uh, around the island. Those little birds with, with the yellow on their wings, and you find them in quite large numbers. Uh, we've had flocks here of 50, but some people have mentioned flocks that maybe were more than 100 or 200 strong. And when they have very successful years, they seem to uh, erupt in, in uh, unpredictable directions and uh, they'll often come to your feeder as well to feed and in addition to the chatter uh, a diagnostic sound is the uprising slur that the males make Zip. and uh, I recorded uh, a pair of individuals here so you get the sound before you hear the winter flock There's the diagnostic sound. Here's a winter flock. House finch. This, uh, this bird has started singing the last week or so, and it has a long, sweet song, but it's, it's easiest to recognize when you can pick out the one or two harsh notes that are included at the end. And it's got a little bit of red on its head and chest. Here it goes. Harsh note. Canada goose. You might wonder why I bothered to put Canada geese in, but not only are they easily to recognize by sound and sight, but most people overlook their habits and at this time of year they're pairing off uh, to go and nest they're one of the early nesters and um, so you'll see them in pairs and sometimes uh, just one because either the male or the female is going to forage while parent number one or two is looking after the nest site and that goes on through till May when <clears throat> the young are born and they head to waterways. And once they've reached the water, the young are unable to fly at that point. And the adults also lose their feather, uh, many of their feathers, they, they molt. And particularly the, the flight feathers are important. They're no longer able to fly either till about the middle of August. So they stick around, they don't call very much, they stay very quiet in June, July, early August. And uh, ideally they'll be along the shoreline or on lakes where there's overhanging trees. And so they're very inconspicuous. And uh, parent number one will be at the front of a line of little, uh, little geese. And parent number two will be immediately behind them. They'll be looking after them they're very successful parents. Then they start to fly in August 
And after that, they start to join up with other families until they're in flocks of three or four families and you'll see them flying around again and uh, eating the grass on the golf course and the playing fields and farm fields. Uh, and then all through the winter, they migrate back and forth. Uh, they use uh, shallow waterways uh, like the, uh, uh, the uh, Booth Canal and um, Walker's Hook uh, at night. And very often they'll fly after dark or before dawn. Not always the case, we're always aware of some of them. But if you're out uh, before dawn or after dark, you'll often hear them flying over. They're again quite secretive in many cases, uh, moving to and from uh, their resting places. So they're, they're quite an interesting species. And again, they mate for life. And this bird lives up to 30 years. So it gains a lot of experience of its habitat. Um, and because of the mild climate again, they stay here year round. But in the east or anywhere east of the Rockies, it's not the case. The lakes freeze up, uh, food is scarce, and they migrate south for the winter. And this uh, first part of this recording was a flock returning uh, it was on, I was on the banks of the Saguenay River in Quebec, and you can uh, get some idea from the recording that there are at least a thousand of them in this flock heading north. <laughs> Purple Martin, Eastern and Western example. Now we're moving on to spring migrants, and the Purple Martin is one of the uh, interesting stories around here. 30 years ago, there were perhaps only five pairs left, uh, but with the uh, as most of their natural habitat had been removed, uh, people got together, formed a society, and built nest boxes. In the east, uh, they, they nest a little bit more communally in uh, kind of condominium type nest boxes, all within one large box. And here on the west coast, they're a little more picky and they like uh, individual boxes, but still nesting as a colony fairly close together. So here first are some Eastern ones. These were on a lake in Saskatchewan, last mountain lake. And as you'll hear, they tend to all come out of their boxes more or less at the same time in the morning. Here's the Western example. Swainson's thrush. Lovely flute-like song of the Swainson's thrush. Uh, they arrive in the middle of May and stop singing in the middle of July. 
And they've usually had two broods. And one or two will stick around and use their contact calls, which sound like wit or wit purr, through maybe till even early September, I've heard one or two. But most of them, uh, certainly the adults, migrate almost straight away in July. Um, so listen to the flute-like song and the contact calls. Out of curiosity last May, because we weren't going on a trip, I got up before dawn and counted all the songs for a day through till dusk. And I counted 3,707 songs in a day. And you might say, I must have been pretty bored to do that. Well, it was quite a chore. Anyway. Wit. Wit. Wit per. White crowned sparrow. Uh, this is another spring migrant, but one or two do stay now for the winter. Um, but they, they, they're very quiet and they, they do visit feeders. But the, the song they sing in the summer, you just heard one phrase, uh, the mnemonic is Paul Will Peedy's Pants. Brown-headed cowbird. I'll play you one song before I talk about this interesting critter. That sound. Uh, that's the brown-headed cowbird. It actually, uh, that song moves through 11,000 hertz, uh, a frequency, uh, the widest range that any bird song makes. And it's all within our hearing, although it doesn't sound that far, but it's it's important because of their development. Uh, they they uh, evolved with the buffalo on the prairies, and initially they were called buffalo birds. And because they spent their time riding on the back of the buffalo, uh, eating, picking off the insects in the buffalo's fur, the buffalo liked having them around. And then as the buffalo moved through the grass, they disturbed lots of insects that flew up and provided more food for the buffle head. But because, uh, sorry, the, the, the cowbirds, um, and because the, bu the, the, the buffalo were always on the move, uh, the cowbirds no longer could stick around, make a nest, raise the young in one place. And they became uh, past, I can't say it, parasitizing uh, other bird nests like the cuckoos in Europe. And so uh, on their trip through across the prairies, uh, they'd see a nest and they would pop out. And uh, uh, if the, the female left the nest, they'd drop an egg in and go on their merry way. And sometimes the host birds would raise the young. However, because this evolved over thousands of years, some of the local birds, like uh, say the yellow warbler, uh, when they spotted a cowbird uh, egg, they would build another nest on top and get rid of the cowbird egg that way. Now, once the buffalo were more or less extinct in the 1890s on the prairies, the cowbirds moved on and spread out all across North America. And uh, we've seen them sometimes on horse or cow's backs doing the same kind of thing, but uh, all across the country, the other birds beyond the prairies have not learned a defense mechanism about against the cowbirds. So they've become very successful. 
Uh, last spring, I remember someone counted 25 of them on reaching Salt Spring one day, and just a day or so later, three of them uh, reached our feeder. And they've become uh, quite a problem in some places. If you're familiar with the Kirtland's warbler in, in uh, northern Michigan, which is a very small population of warblers between 500 and about 1,600. They fluctuate back and forth. They spend the winter in, uh, in the Bahamas and then fly to northern uh, Michigan. A few occasionally stop in, in southern Ontario, but they have very strict demands. They only nest in young jack pines that are between uh, 12 and 15 feet or uh, four and five meters in height. And the rangers there now have developed some tactics to try and protect this tiny population of warblers. And they uh, burn down the pines in blocks when they get over uh, five meters. And they put out big catch uh, cages for uh, the brown-headed cowbirds. I was, uh, I finally found a, a, a warbler to record there. And then I came across these huge cages with two dozen or more cowbirds in them that had been caught. And obviously they were going to be euthanized at some point, but I was quite amazed to, to find a cage with at least 24 cowbirds in it. Duration collared dove. Now I'm going to go on uh, and discuss three uh, owls that are fairly common on Salt Spring. But first, I'm going to cover two more species that I sometimes get phone calls about to, to, uh, at this time of year saying, I'm hearing an owl in the daytime. Uh, which is it? And these are two of the species that often sound, uh, give hook-like calls that uh, confuse people sometimes. So here first is the Eurasian collared dove, which uh, uh, arrived in North America only about 30 years ago, having escaped from a pet shop in the Bahamas and uh, has successfully uh, colonized all across North America. Common raven. This is another bird that uh, sticks around in pairs and you can usually see or, or hear them uh, as a pair uh, contacting each other as they fly over your property. Um, they are an amazing bird because uh, for, for several reasons, but one is that they have such a wide variety of vocal sounds at uh, Cornell uh, they've got examples of about 33 different calls that these critters make, and there are probably more than that. Um, in my recordings, I collected together uh, 11, I think it's 11, 11 or 12 different sounds, and two of them sound a bit like owls. Have a listen. That's one. Thank you. 
beat. Very distinctive drum beat. beats quite distinctive and there's the there's the other sound that sounds like an owl i heard that sound yesterday great horned owl so here's the first of the more common owls i know of at least three pairs on salt spring and they're common all across North America. Um, the uh, you'll you'll hear the uh, the song and uh, some other sounds that these owls make. That deeper one is the male. That's a begging call. Who's awake? Me too. Alarm call by the female. Bill clapping. Bill clapping by the female again. Bard owl. So here's the next one, another fairly common one on Salt Spring. They uh, they used to be confined to the Gulf Coast area of North America, but as land was cleared, they moved around the forest in the eastern seaboard, across the boreal forest, uh, uh, because they need open areas for feeding. Uh, they, they nest in trees, but need marshland or grassland to feed, to catch small mammals and many other species. And uh, then they were first spotted in uh, Prince George in 1944, Victoria in 66, and in the 80s, they were first seen in California. They have, of course, uh, uh, displaced some of the spotted owls, and they are thought to have eaten a lot of the western screech owls, but they eat much else, uh, uh, snakes, ma small mammals, uh, fish. In, uh, in the Gulf area where they, they used to live, uh, because they eat so much uh, uh, crawfish and uh, shrimp that the underparts of their wings actually turn pink. Here's the song. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? There's a, the scream. Quite a vocal display. <laughs> Northern Pygmy Owl. This last one, a small owl, uh, quite common on Salt Spring. I've recorded them on the Musgrave Landing Road, and I've heard them on Stewart Road and um, um, Bettis Beach Road, uh, amongst other places. Uh, they have a simple hoot, and uh, they hunt by day and night. And in the daytime, they're hunting songbirds. And you might see them amongst a flock of songbirds, which may turn around and mob. And on the back of the pygmy owl's head, 
there are feathers that look like a pair of eyes and that might be a kind of defense mechanism nobody really knows but uh, it's an interesting feature uh, if you're looking at them night time daytime there's a there's a, a woodpecker in the background a flicker so that's all the critters uh i've uh, prepared recordings of the other owls, golden crowned sparrow sorry i better turn him off um or you'll have to stay for another hour <laughs> uh, the, the other owls you might find on Salt Spring that are more difficult to find are the barn owl, western screech, and the sawwet. But I think, I think that's it, David.